All right. Hi, good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, November the 16th, 2021. My name is Ashley Glover, and I'm here with Vincent Russo. And this program is over the estate tax advantage of QPRITs, Qualified Personal Residence Trusts. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we dive in, let's open with some housekeeping items. To help minimize distractions, we have muted your microphones. Please submit questions through the Q&A window provided on your Zoom toolbar. We have saved time at the end for Q&A. We should be together for about 45 minutes. We created a PowerPoint for this program, which we are showing on the screen along with our webcams. We are recording this and we'll email you a link to the recording. There will be a webinar survey that pops up on your browser once we conclude. Uh, we thank you in advance for answering a few questions. So now let's introduce our speaker, Vincent J. Russo. Vincent is the firm's managing partner. He has his master's in tax law. He is nationally recognized speaker and author on elder law, special needs, and estate planning. He's a founding member, fellow, and fifth president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. He's also co-founder for the Teresa Alessandra Russo Foundation for Children with Special Needs, which was established in the memory of his daughter. Uh, so Vincent, uh, thank you for being here. I apologize, we're a few minutes late today, but I think we can probably make up for some time. <laughs> Floor is yours, Vincent. Okay, thank you, Ashley. And uh, yes, sorry for the little delay. Uh, today, we're going to focus in on Qualified Personal Residence Trust. It's an amazing, helpful estate planning uh, tool uh, that um, you can utilize uh, to save estate taxes. So we're going to talk about what is a QPERT, why do I need one, and what are the tax benefits. So let's start with the basics here of what is a QPERT a qualified personal residence trust. And this is something that's authorized by the um, Internal Revenue Service. A QPERT is an irrevocable grantor trust. So two important components here. One is that it's irrevocable, that allows for the estate tax savings, and that it's a grantor trust. And we'll talk a little more about how that's helpful from an income tax standpoint. So this trust allows an individual to take advantage of the gift tax exemption by putting a personal residence, either primary or secondary, into a trust at a discounted value. What I mean by that is that the gift, the value of the transfer of the residence will be discounted. So you're using up less of your gift tax exemption. We're talking here federal gift tax exemption. Um, in New York here, there is no uh, gift tax law. The grantor then decides how long he or she will retain possession and use of the residence. Uh, and we call that the term. Once the term is up, ownership is either retained by the trust or passed on to the beneficiaries. That'll be a planning option. Ultimately, a cupid reduces estate taxes to the grantor and benefits the grantor's heirs and beneficiaries. So let's look at what are the requirements. The trust may only hold a residence of the grantor to be used or held for personal use as a personal residence. So you, you, you see here, it's got to be a residence and it's got to be used or held for personal use. And that'll make it a personal residence for these rules. So a personal residence is defined as a principal residence or one other residence which is used or held for personal use. So for example, your primary residence would be the first residence and the other would be perhaps a second home or a vacation home. The trust may not be used for a purpose other than as a personal residence during the term. Remember the term is a term of years where you're using the residence as your, for your own personal use. The trust assets in the trust are limited to the residence and any additional cash for payment of expenses. So there is um, a, some wiggle room here to put monies into the trust 
or the payment of expenses. And you have to follow the rules here to meet the requirements. So let's talk about that use of the residence during the term. It allows the grantor to retain possession and use of the residence. So for all practical uh, purposes, nothing really has changed. Um, you're going to be responsible for the real estate taxes, maintaining the home. You're going to use it um, in any fashion you want uh, during the uh, term. Now, during that term, the grantor, including a spouse and any dependents, can continue to live in the residence without any changes. And there'll be no change from a tax standpoint in terms of deductibility of, of let's say, real estate taxes. This means that the grantor can live rent free and will continue to pay any normal operating expenses applicable to the personal residence. As a result, the grantor can also claim all the appropriate income tax deductions on his or her tax return, such as real estate tax deduction. Now, there are some additional rules when it comes to qualifying as a cuper. And I just want to highlight here what's called the cessation of use of a personal residence. So <clears throat> during the term, if that residence is sold, then certain steps need to be taken in order to maintain qualifying as a cuper. Or if there was damage to a destruction of the personal residence, let's say a fire uh, that basically rendered uh, the home unusable. So when there is cessation of use, then steps need to be taken. And there's an option here. If you sell a residence, you'll have the option within a two year period to purchase a replacement residence. And depending on the proceeds from the initial sale and the proceeds needed for the purchase, there may be additional monies needed or there may be excess monies in that um, Cupert, and then we have to follow the rules what to do in that situation. If a decision is made not to replace the home, then during that remaining term period, so term of years, so someone picks a 10-year term, and in year six, they sell the residence, then there would be a cessation of use. The remaining four years, um, what happens here is that these proceeds from the sale are converted into a qualified annuity payment, which then would be made for the remaining balance of the term or that four years in my example. So in effect, some of you are maybe familiar with the concept of a grant, and it would basically convert that cash from the sale of the residence into a grant. So you may be asking yourself, well, when do I need one or two? As I said, you can do it for your primary residence or for a second home. So I just want to highlight here whether uh, highlight here what the tax rates and exemption amounts are right now. So you can think about, do I have a taxable estate? What might that look like from a tax standpoint? And that would be a motivating factor to um, implement this strategy of the Cooper. Or you may be concerned that these exemption amounts may come down in the future. Uh, the federal exemption is, is set to sunset in 2026. So you wanna get ahead of the curve here and implement planning that's permitted under the current laws. Recently, there was an attack of some of these strategies uh, and, and language was in the House bill, uh, which now has been removed. Uh, so we do have, uh, we'll have no change on some of those uh, <clears throat> prohibitions that were being discussed regarding these um, estate tax strategies. So let's look at the rates and the exemption amount. For federal, the, the estate tax rate, max rate is 40%. Uh, and in New York, it's 16%. Now, if you have an estate of under 11,700,000, there's no federal tax. If 
you have an estate of under 5,930,000, there's no New York tax. So you can't have a New York tax and no federal tax if you fall in between the basically 6 million and 11, seven million dollar amount. Now there's a warning here about the New York state estate tax cliff that if your estate equals or exceeds $6,226,500, then you lose your exemption completely. And New York taxes you your estate on the very first dollar. So here's a, a chart that gives you some examples of what the tax might look like. No federal or New York state tax at 5,930. Look at that estate uh, tax cliff at 6,226,500. You've got a $538,992,000 tax. In many situations that can be avoided with estate planning. Now, if you have in the state of 11 million seven, look at that New York tax. It goes up to $1,338,800 for New York residents, those who are domiciled in New York. If you were at 23,400,000, now we've got a federal tax of over 3.3 million, a New York tax in excess of 3.2 million for a total tax of six million six hundred six thousand four hundred eighty dollars if i was married with that amount of money and each of us have our eleven million seven hundred thousand dollar exemption no federal tax but if you split those assets in half and paid the new york tax that tax would be two million six hundred seventy seven thousand six hundred so you can kind of figure out how much you have in your estate uh, and where you might fall based on this chart. Now, I mentioned the sunset provision. So this chart shows you what will happen uh, in 2026 unless uh, there's a Congress takes action to change the sunset. The sunset means a reversal of the exemption that we currently have at 11,700,000 that gets adjusted each year upward um, back to basically what it would have looked like based on the prior law. So the estimate is somewhere around $6 million. So here, if, if we're in 2026 with, with the sunset, or if Congress decides to act before, you could see how the federal tax can kick in over 2 million on 11 million seven close to 7 million on 23,400 and married with the lower exemption amount, you could be looking at a tax closing in on $5 million. So that's a significant potential change. Also the tax rate could be increased. That was proposed uh, this year, 40 to 45%, uh, but was not implemented. In addition to these numbers, depending on the state you're domiciled in, you would have potential additional state estate taxes. So those are really good reasons, I think, to motivate us that if you have a taxable estate, what strategies are available to minimize or eliminate the tax? Now, last week I discussed with you SLATs, Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, a wonderful vehicle, I think, probably the most popular vehicle right now. Today, we're talking about Cuperts and the asset we're focusing in on our residences. So what are the tax benefits here? I think an example would be helpful. If a client wants to pass their house onto their children, which is valued at a million dollars, how could they do it using the Cupert tax saving strategy? Currently, the client does not have a plan to move out of the house. They intend to live there the rest of their life, but you know things can happen and perhaps in the future, maybe the house could be sold. To reduce the tax impact, because this client has a taxable estate, the client wants to set up a Cupert for a term of 10 years. 
Now, I'm going to assume that over the 10 years, the house increases at 4% annually in value. So the million dollar house would appreciate after 10 years to $1,480,244. So this is a situation where a client comes into my office, informs me they have a taxable estate, they don't want to give Uncle Sam any more than they need to, or in New York State, they own a significant asset, their house, or a second home, and now we're talking about doing planning. Straightforward here, they want to leave their assets when they pass away. The client wants to leave um, his or her assets to the children. And in this trust, we're going to use a 10-year term. So it's a gift. The house goes into the trust, and it's a gift. It's not a dollar-for-dollar dollar gift. It's a what I'll call a discounted gift. Sometimes we say we've leveraged the gift. And what we mean by that is that because you retain the right to live there rent-free, that has value. And that value reduces the gift that you made. So let's say this client is 65 years old and they set up a 10-year term in their trust with the million dollar house. Now, one of the things we have to do when calculating the value of the gift is we have to understand what the section 7520 rate is. That's a rate set by the government each month. Uh, it will vary. Uh, and that rate is basically reflecting the interest rate. And that's going to be a factor in determining the value of the gift. So when we calculate these numbers based on the facts that I've given you, the value of the non-taxable interest retained by the grantor, that's the client, the parent, is $316,730. So we subtract that amount from the million dollars, and now we've made a gift of $683,270. No problem, we file a gift tax return. By April 15th of the following year, we get an appraisal of the house. We then do the calculation for the cupert, and you file a tax return. You use your exemption amount, your federal gift and estate tax exemption amount against the $683,270. So no taxes are owed. So what we have in effect done is we've given away a million dollar house with the IRS valuing it at $683,000 allowing the 316,000 to not be subject to the exemption offset. And hence, we're saving estate taxes on that 316,000. Now, you have to outlive the term in order to get the benefit of this strategy. If you should pass during the term, then the residents would be included back into your estate. Once the parent outlives the term, the residence is excluded for estate tax purposes. The appreciation in the residence from the date you fund it will also escape estate taxation. Here, the potential estate savings would be uh, $358,638. That's the savings. So I got to go back. Um, and correct something I said earlier. In this calculation, uh, the value of the gift uh, is, um, I gotta go up here, the value of the retained interest would be 316,730. So I might've misstated. The taxable gift is the 683,270. All right, so that's correct what I've stated here. The reason for the estate tax savings being 358,638 is it's saving on the amount that was gifted, not subject to tax, and the avoidance of tax on the appreciation. So I think that clarifies it for you. 
Sorry for going back and forth. After the term, the grantor can pay fair market rent with no adverse income tax consequences, thus allowing these payments to avoid gift taxation. So once the term is up, the grantor no longer has the right to live there rent free. They must pay fair market rent. That rent payment can be used to pay real estate taxes and maintain the home. And because from a tax standpoint, this may be a little confusing, the grantor, the parent who set up the trust, is both the owner of the trust for income tax purposes, because we put language in there making it what's called a grantor trust, and is also the tenant paying the rent. So in effect, you, the person who set this up, are both the landlord and the tenant. And the IRS says, if you're the landlord and the tenant, then we ignore that there's any tax consequences to those payments. If you have a larger taxable estate, by paying rent, you're actually reducing the size of your estate by those rent payments, and they're not treated as a gift. So it's an additional way of getting monies out of your estate for estate tax purposes. So the summary here on tax benefits, the, the strategy removes the grantor's personal residence from your estate, including any future appreciated value at a reduced value for purposes of the gift, which results in a reduced use of your exemption amount. Essentially, the longer the cupid term, the larger the grantor retained interest and the smaller the amount of the gift tax exemption used, because you want to use every dollar of your exemption to the max. But here is the quandary for the client. The longer the term, the greater the risk that I may not outlive the term and hence have it come back into my estate. So each client has to make a value judgment on their particular circumstances and their, their um, propensity to risk and decide what would be the appropriate term. The term can never be longer than the life expectancy uh, tables. All right, so that's a discussion we, we have whenever we're doing this strategy. So that's the beauty of a Cupert. Um, now I wanna just talk about uh, the estate tax proposal, in case you're not aware that there were a number of changes in the tax laws that were being proposed in the House bill. Thankfully, all of those provisions have been removed, but it kind of was like a warning shot for us. Um, so let me just tell you a little about what was proposed. Increasing the estate tax rate to 45%, reducing the exemption of 11 million seven down to $6 million. Uh, disallowing the use of cuperts, grats, and slats, and islets as tax planning strategies that would avoid estate taxation. So those are pretty significant changes. And so it behooves all of us who, if you have a taxable estate, to think in terms of acting now uh, to make um, changes, reducing your estate or avoiding potential estate taxes uh, because those strategies could be eliminated in the future by Congress. So some of the strategies here that we discuss with our clients, discounting gifts is, I think, very important uh, aspect of our planning strategies. We just went over the Cupert, which does that. If you're, you also can do this in a grant format, a grantor retained annuity trust, and place liquid assets in a trust, retain an annuity payment for a term. And once you outlive the term, then those assets are outside of your estate and the gift is discounted uh, because of your retained interest. Also, we couple that grad strategy often with the use of LLCs so that if you had a business in an LLC or if you have liquid assets like brokerage assets, you can fund that into an LLC 
and create voting and non-voting units or ownership units like shares of stock. And those units, if they're non-voting are worth less than the voting units. So it's a way of gifting those units, non-voting at a discounted value. Last week, I discussed the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, which is a way of getting assets out immediately out of your estate based on a dollar for dollar gift, but there is the ability to pull those monies back to you if you needed them uh, through your spouse. So um, if you wanted more information on that, please contact us um, or go to our website uh, and um, listen in on our, the recording of the webinar I did last week. Also in larger estates, we think in terms of dynasty trusts or generation skipping trusts. Why would you want to have an estate subject to tax in your estate, pass it on to children who then when they die, it's subject to tax in their estate uh, before it moves on to the grandchildren. So there are strategies to skip the generation while still using those assets for the benefit of the children, but excluding them for estate tax purposes in their estate. And then lastly, charitable gifting. As we get to year end here, charitable gifts um, um, are made often by our clients. Um, you get a tax deduction for doing that. There are a number of different ways of charitable gifting where you can minimize estate taxes. And one of the strategies would be a charitable remainder trust where you put assets into a trust you retain an annuity stream for the rest of your lifetime. And then the remainder at the end passes to the charity. You get an upfront charitable deduction and that can save existing estate taxes. And you can use that tax savings if you'd like to purchase insurance in an irrevocable life insurance trust, which then is not taxed. So uh, sometimes referred to as a replacement trust. So. These strategies uh, can get complex, uh, but when you look at the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that you may owe in taxes, it's well worth spending the time to investigate whether this makes sense for you. So I always say, understand how the estate tax rules, the laws impact you today. Think about what it might look like in the future um, create a plan and you got to do it in advance. And right now we have these laws that allow for a number of different planning strategies that can um, save on the uh, state uh, taxes. And then lastly, the key is to implement your plan. So it's good to understand where you are with taxes, know what your options are, uh, but you've got to implement them. With a tax professional, we're happy to meet with you and, and discuss your options, figure out what you're comfortable with, and then implement those strategies. So with that um, summary, um, Ashley, questions uh, that may have come in? I don't see questions yet, but this is a good reminder that for those of you attending live, uh, go ahead and send those in through the Q&A window on the Zoom toolbar. Um, we might be able to jump to the next slide and I can just briefly talk about the, the Russo Law Group while we wait for a question or two. Okay. All right, so what, what makes Russo Law Group different? Uh, Team Russo can use its experience and knowledge to help provide solutions to your problems or maybe better yet, help you uh, avoid problems in the future. We truly care about our clients. We have over 35 years of estate planning experience. We're in three convenient office locations, Garden City, Lido Beach, and Islandia. We will make home visits if necessary and arrange for out of office document signings. We are also available for virtual meetings and consultations. Uh, we are very strong with handling crisis situations and we have a robust trust and estate administration department. Uh, we are a large firm with several partners and associates, 
which is a good thing for you because it means that someone's always available to help you. Um, we are also ranked as a best law firm by the US News. So please put our experience to the test. Feel free to give me a call after if anyone has questions about our services or if you'd like to speak with an attorney about your estate plan. Uh, finally, if you're looking to do a little more research on estate tax, feel free to download Vincent's complimentary estate tax planning guide, which is on our website. I will drop the link now in the chat window. I uh, believe the link is also showing on the slide in front of you. Um, that about wraps it up for this one. Vincent, let me yeah. go back and see if we had any questions popping. Yeah, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing questions. Um, so Lisa asked the question, what happens if Congress does pass to uh, active trusts that are no longer valid? So uh, I think the question here is, um, what if Congress does take steps to prohibit, uh, for example, the use of a cupid? Uh, if you already have one in place, um, it will be grandfathered. I mean, that's historically what's always been done. Um, and so if we got word that Congress was going to implement, typically it'll be effective as of date of enactment, which, mean, which means when the president signs the bill. So right now there's nothing in the House bill, um, in the Build Better Back bill, and we don't expect that it will come back in, even though no one can guarantee that. So it looks like we're gonna have a pass this year. Next year is an election year. Typically, there is no tax legislation passed in an election year. And that might get us to another year after that, depending on who is in the White House and who controls Congress and what the state of affairs are with our deficit. Uh, we could see changes. We know that by 2026, though, there will be a sunset of the exemption. So that's, so that's kind of where we stand. The key is for someone um, in our firm, one of our experienced attorneys, to sit with you to make sure where, that you understand where you stand today, what your options are today, and, and what choices you have. And, and what are the consequences of planning now versus waiting? Um, so let me just go over a couple questions that are typical uh, of the cupid before we wrap up. First is, um, can I sell my house during the term? And the answer is yes. Then the question is, um, <clears throat> will I be, can I use my $250,000 capital gain exclusion? And the answer will be yes. It's a grantor trust. You'll be able to sell the home and use your exclusion. If you're married, you'd be able to use it as long as you meet the other requirements of the capital ex gain exclusion rule up to $500,000. Another question, when the term expires, can my children or the trustee throw me out of the house? Um, and so here, um, the trustee, if it's left in trust, is the owner. Uh, and we've had no experiences of something of that nature. Um, but as I mentioned, from a tax standpoint, you can remain in the home by entering into a rental arrangement. Key here is, in any trust that you set up, that you're comfortable with the trustees that you appoint. Now you can put a provision in the trust document for you to be able to remove the trustee and appoint an independent trustee if for some reason you and the trustee were not on the same page. The next question is this, if I outlive the term, how much am I saving in taxes? You're going to save the appreciation of that home from the date you fund it to the current value, fair market value. And you will also save estate taxes on the discounted amount because you retain the right to live there for a term of years. So those are some of the more basic questions that we have. Um, I guess the other one 
would be if I, if the house is sold during the term, can I purchase a new home, a replacement home? And the answer is yes. The trust would be um, replacing the home you sold with a new home. Obviously, you would suggest to the trustee what that home would be. All right, if you have other questions, please don't hesitate to uh, contact us. Um, we're more than happy to meet with you. Um, I think, uh, Ashley, there's a survey at the end. There it is. Uh, please expect a survey to pop up on your screen momentarily. It's just a, a handful of questions there, so we, we appreciate your feedback. Yeah, three very simple questions. <laughs> Um, so we kept it real basic, but we do appreciate your input. I want to thank Ashley for helping me put this program together. Have a great day. And uh, we look forward to uh, meeting you in our office. All right. Be well, stay safe, and uh, happy holidays. We have Thanksgiving next week. So that's always fun. Enjoy your turkey and family time. <laughs> All right. Bye.